So how many of you are really bad at keeping secrets? Raise your hand. I mean, seriously. Thank you. Last service, there was only one hand. And I'm going to tell you, it was Elaine Harris, okay? (laughs) You do not want to tell her anything. But there were too many hands here. But thank you for being honest, because when I was a kid, um, I was horrible at keeping secrets. I'm better now. Most of the time when you share things in confidence, I don't share it, okay? (laughs) But back then, I actually took great joy in being a spoiler, and especially to the members of my immediate family, whether it was like spoiling the ending of a book or a movie or telling them what I really loved was telling them what they were going to get for like Hanukkah or something. And I was such a well-known spoiler in my family that they went to great lengths to hide presents from me, but I'd always find them. It didn't matter where they hid them. And when I did, I would kind of carefully peel back the, the scotch tape and then the wrapping, just enough to see what it was. And, uh, and then I loved to tease my brother that I knew what he was getting. And of course, by then he wants to know what it is. And I would drag things out until he got really frustrated, which was usually the point that he threatened to beat me up if I didn't tell him. So I told him, because he was a lot bigger than me and older. And then, okay, that's like a quick window into my twisted dif- dysfunctional world. But I took a lot of joy in that world back then. And uh, ironically, as we continue in our series in Ephesians, the title of this message is The Secret Path to Transformation. And we're about to discover what I believe is the most important strategy you can have in your tool bag to become the kind of person God created you to be. And I call this strategy a secret because the strategy in our passage today is so simple, most people tend to miss it completely and instead invest in strategies that really don't take them where they want to go. And so I'm going to go back to my roots as a spoiler today and reveal this secret, which is going to bring me a lot of joy. So I'm looking forward to kind of connecting back to my childhood. So let's read our passage. It comes from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 11. And... Um, it's actually divided, it's divided up into three sections, and I purposely put them on a separate slide because I want you to see how they're broken down here. So let's read the first section, which is just verses 11 through 13, and this is what it says. The Messiah himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Messiah may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure in the fullness of Messiah. Second section is verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning of craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. And then the final section is verses 15 through 16. Instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, meaning Jesus, right? That is the Messiah, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. I'm going to spend a little time in each section. In this first section, Paul defines a few key roles within the body of Messiah. And some streams of Christianity define these three roles. They call it the five-fold leadership roles within the church. And it's it's an exclusive list. Uh, Others see this as a short list of divinely imparted gifts uh, in the church. And I'm not going to jump into either of those ditches today. You can Google it and you can discover which position or some other position you want to take about it. For the purpose of this message, the only point I want to make about these roles is that Paul is describing a group of gifted and trained leaders who are charged with helping uh, to create an environment within the context of a local church that will ultimately lead to real transformation and maturity. The end goal is to prepare others for what is described here as works of service. In other words... uh, These leaders are to help others overcome the obstacles in their life that prevent them from growing up into fully functional people of faith so that they can contribute 
to the greater good of the church that they belong to and to humanity in general. And so Paul uses maturity themes in this first section like strengthening the body of Messiah, achieving unity in our faith, a collective knowledge about who Jesus is and how he lived his life. And then he wraps this section up saying, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, of Messiah. In other words, the goal is, oh, thank you. I forgot, I got to put this here because I'm sponsored by In-N-Out Burger. Let me have a drink here. Mm. Yeah, that's a double-double flavor in there right now. Doesn't that sound good right now? How many are thinking to your In-N-Out experience in California, just as I said that? Huh? Animal style. Animal style. Yeah, the question is raw onions or grilled onions? That's the only question. Oh, no. Now you're sounding like my wife. She loves grilled onions. I like them raw. Where the heck was I? Okay. <laughs> he wraps this up saying that we are to become mature, attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. And here, here, this is something worth writing down, okay? The goal is simply for us to become more like Jesus so that we can live our lives more like Jesus, all right? That is the goal. The goal is to become more like Jesus so that we can live our lives more like Jesus. And being immature means that we're not being very successful at that with our lives, okay? And this is what Paul means when he says works of service. Don't think of just a specific role to have here but a a more broader thought is that we are doing what Jesus did. We're living our life how he lived his life. Here at Cornerstone uh, Boulder, transformation is one of the nine elements that we have that drives everything we do here. And on uh, one of the main objectives of our staff, the people that we pay and our volunteer leadership is to create uh, uh, an environment that leads to real and lasting change. And if you've ever, um, if you've never taken a look at our nine elements, you can find them because <clears throat> probably you're here because we are we are a very unique congregation for a lot of reasons. And these nine elements are are the the values that drive that uniqueness. So if you, wanna, if you haven't checked them out, go on our website, right on our homepage, scroll down to the bottom. All nine of them are listed there. They all have videos, uh, short videos. They all have long messages that uh, unpackage each of these values. And those are the things that make us Cornerstone Boulder. But transformation is, is really big here, as, as the, all the other ones are. Um, Paul moves from this theme of the goal is to mature, to become like Jesus so we can live like Jesus, to in the second section, he describes the problem that this kind of transformation will solve. And here's the problem. Then, meaning once you mature, you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And clearly, immaturity in the form of some kind of a dysfunction is the problem here because the context in this passage suggests a person who's vulnerable, easy influenced by things like maybe the latest fads that come and go that really don't deliver what they promise, or con artists who only want to control them and their money, or maybe a little bit of both of those things. These are the people who don't have a solid footing in life. And I don't think Paul's intent is to limit immaturity to only these two issues. He's really speaking to all of us who have deep wounds from our past that tend to make us more desperate and more vulnerable to be drawn to things and to people that can take advantage of us. And unfortunately, there are many in the world who know how to exploit our weaknesses. And so in our desperation, we can easily be drawn to ineffective strategies 
or we can follow a sham leader whose main goal is to part us from our hard-earned money. Actually, both those things are. One of the uh, places that I visit in Israel is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. How many people have been to the Church of the Holy? Raise it high. I'd like to see that. Perfect. Um, it's a, um, I take my people there. It's not my favorite site to go to, though. It's just for the experience. Um, the, if you don't know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is one of two locations that is believed where Jesus was crucified and then buried in a tomb. Uh, The other one is the garden tomb. We all want it to be the garden tomb because it's a very serene place. It's probably not. It's probably the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, But anyways, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is listed by the Catholic Church as one of several pilgrimage sites where Catholics can receive what is called plenary indulgences. An indulgence, according to Catholic doctrine, is the authority that the Catholic Church has from God to take away all or part of someone's temporal earthly punishments due to sin in their life. And they wrongly base this authority on the teaching found in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus says to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, meaning in their interpretation that Peter is the first pope and the beginning of the Catholic church. And from a passage uh, just after that, that wrongly, they wrongly interpret indulgence authority based off this sentence, which says, whatever you loose or bind in heaven will be loosed or bound on earth. And they totally miss the clear Jewish context of this passage because that particular phrase was a very common rabbinic uh, saying to loose and bind. And they, because there were no Jewish eyes on the scriptures for a very long time, they came up with this kind of false doctrine. Um, and they believe, based on that, that they have the authority to reduce, or even in the case of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, completely absolve a person from the earthly consequences of their sin. Okay, so each year, this is what makes this, this site a little sad and a little crazy. Each year... Thousands and thousands of deceived pilgrims pay thousands and thousands of dollars to travel to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, believing they can be instantly delivered from the consequences of their faults as they fall in tears upon the stone where it is believed that Jesus was laid when he was taken off the cross. And it's really sad to see these very vulnerable men and women so easily deceived. Now, I want to be clear. I clearly believe that Catholics uh, who b- have put their faith in Jesus are our brothers and sisters in Christ and are part of the universal family of God. But I have no respect for this deception that is built upon a false doctrine, and I believe this kind of exploitation of, uh, of vulnerable people is exactly the kind of thing Paul has in view here. I feel the same way. Let me just not pick on Catholics, okay? I feel the same way about evangelical and charismatic televangelists and pastors who promise healings or deliverances or financial blessings or whatever the promise is, right? If you will only, by faith, of course, send them your money. Shame on all of them for using faith as a way to profit themselves. Now, when we launched the Dream Boulder Initiative, it made us a little nervous because we never want to connect giving to promises that we have no authority to make here at Cornerstone. And so when it comes to giving, we choose to err more on the side of being cautious. And don't worry, the secret to the path of transformation involves no money exchange, all right? But this might be a good time to pass the offering bags. (laughs) By the way, have you noticed we don't have offering bags here? And that's intentional as well. All right, enough of that little soapbox rant. Paul is simply saying that his desire is that we grow up, that we become mature, 
become more and more like Jesus so we can live more and more like Jesus so that we would no longer be vulnerable and weak but secure and strong. Remember, the book of Ephesians is about having a secure, strong identity. And if you hear here last week, you heard Pastor Brian say, what good is it to study about our identity if it doesn't lead to our transformation? This is Paul's point here, okay? And so in section three, Paul finally arrives at revealing the secret path to transformation and here is in, in this section. It says, instead, instead of what? Instead of being immature, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, the Messiah, Jesus. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul is saying here, instead of being like immature infants, instead of being tossed back and forth by the latest trends that come and go, instead of being weak and vulnerable to people that will take advantage of you, I want you to give you a strategy that will actually lead to growing up as functional people of faith, having a secure and strong identity, to a place where you'll become fully mature. And here's Paul's secret formula. You ready for it? It's not going to cost you anything. Paul simply wants us to speak the truth in love to each other. Wait a minute. What about quiet times and Bible readings and prayer and things like that? Those are all important. But this is what he is drilling down on as the main thing that will get us down the road in our maturity. Now, the simple and most common interpretation of this phrase is that when we need, we, we need to have the courage to confront those who offend us in some way or need to be challenged about some destructive behavior in their life. And when we do confront them, we need to unpack it in a way that's loving. We need to consider things like the timing of when we confront, the setting of where we confront, and most importantly, the way or how we confront. And certainly having the courage to confront someone and then doing it in love is an important layer of what Paul is teaching here. But that really wouldn't be much of a secret, would it? And since you all know I love to dive into the deeper layers of a passage, I believe Paul has something much deeper in view here by the phrase, speaking the truth in love. First of all, the Greek word that's translated, speak the truth, is literally translated, be true, or being true. It doesn't actually have the word speak in it. And translators add the word speak because they believe it implies speaking, and certainly speaking is a part of it. However, a more literal translation, I think, gets deeper into the meaning. So instead of saying speaking the truth in love, a more literal translation would say be true in love, or instead being true in love, which has less to do with the content of what we say to each other, and more about being authentic and transparent with each other. This position makes even more sense if we connect it to a phrase, this phrase, to verse 25, where Paul, in this entire chapter, is continuing to develop what it looks like to be fully mature. And then just prior to verse 25, he talks about putting off our old immature selves and put on our new mature selves and then he says this is verse 25 therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully there's that word again each of you must put off falsehood and be true to your neighbors for we're all members of one body the greek word for falsehood in the sentence is pseudos and i like that the NIV uses the word falsehood here Because this English word really captures the deeper meaning of this Greek text and the deeper teaching in this chapter. Our English word, pseudo, 
comes from this Greek word, and it means to be false, not genuine, hidden, to pretend to be someone or some way that you're not. When an author doesn't use his real name on a book, what's it called? A pseudonym, right? He's hiding his true identity. He's intentionally hiding his true identity, pretending to be someone other than himself. And I believe hiding and pretending to be someone other than ourselves is exactly what Paul has in mind here in chapter 4. And so when Paul says that we should be true in love with each other, I believe the deeper meaning is that Paul is asking us to stop being pseudo, stop presenting our false selves. He wants us to stop hiding. He wants us to take off our masks with each other. He wants us to be authentic. He wants us to be transparent in our relationships. And in so doing, it's very cathartic. It leads to maturity. In fact, if you want to have a, a, a label for what it looks like to be mature, it's to be unmasked. Then you can live more like Jesus, who lived his life 100% unmasked. He was who he was all the time. He wasn't someone different when he showed up to synagogue on Shabbat. There's a lot of pressure, especially in faith communities, especially in, in evangelical and charismatic faith communities to show a false version of ourselves, to wear a mask. Because there's often this expectation, if, you know, if you're a person of faith, I mean, if you're a real person of faith, if you're really following Jesus, you should have all your stuff together. And so instead of being open and honest about things, our wounds, our struggles, our disappointments, our hurts, our doubts, there's not a safe one, right? Our fears. Can you be trusting God and be fearful at the same time? I don't think so. Oh, there's my mask. I'm not fearful. We pretend that everything is okay, and when somebody asks us how we're doing, we'll say something like, I'm fine, everything's great. How are you? I'm fine. And presenting a pseudo or, or false self is what keeps us stuck in bondage. I mean, that is literally what keeps us stuck. It does nothing to move us down the path that leads to maturity. Is this making sense? And so the secret path to transformation is simply that we would have the courage to be authentic to be transparent with each other, which is the only path that truly leads to our liberation. You want to be set free? Take your mask off. Can you imagine an entire church where this is taking place? This is what Paul is asking. Be true to each other in love. Being true is loving. So take a moment. Wow, we are so early. I'm going to do my interpretive dance real quick. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to see that. I didn't get the dance gene. <sighs> You know, we've all got stuff that's hidden, right? I don't care how far you are down the path. There's always something that a light needs to be shined on it. And I want you just to think about that in your own life. Like, what is the one thing or the, what are the, for me, what are the 20 things that, 
for whatever reason, it's usually fear or feeling like I'll be unaccepted. What are those things in your life? And I want to show you a video. I've, I've shown another version of this video a couple times in our church history because it's just so powerful. It's called Two Roads. And um, this one I like because it's, it's about half the time. It's about six minutes long. Um, and if you're like everyone else, okay, so I'm, I want to point anyone out because we're all in the same boat here. If you're like, if you're human, raise your hand if you're human. Sir, you did not raise your hand. So I'd like to hear more from you after this. Aliens spotted at Cornerstone Boulder. I think you'll be blessed by that. I'll just let the video speak for itself. At some point, all of us find ourselves at a fork in the road in our spiritual lives. Suddenly you find yourself staring down two paths, two distinctly different paths. One says pleasing God. The other says trusting God. You look at the trusting God sign. You think it sounds good, except it doesn't give me a whole lot to do. It's too passive. It's like, uh, if we're going to do this Christian life, I mean, really do it, then, then we're going to have to have a little bit something more than just trust, right? So you look back at the pleasing God sign. Now, now that makes sense, right? I mean, because after all he's done for us, the least we can do is please him. So this path leads to the room of good intentions. Oh, man, it is is an impressive room. My golly, with impressive people, passionate people. You're surprised to see that everyone in this room is wearing masks, but they are immaculate and beautiful, like the mask they hand to you. Everyone here is doing just fine. Everyone's serious about working on their sin and on their disciplines and trying to keep God pleased with them. There's an unspoken message in this room. God loves you always, but he likes you a lot less when you mess up. Still, you join this impressive group of people in this impressive room. And, and really, for the most part, um, you actually uh, are, are coming up to standard on most days. I mean, really, you're, you're, you're doing okay. It's like you remember uh, to read your Bible, you pray for others, and you're even reading a couple of chapters in that book that everybody's raving about. God's, God's uh, glad that you're doing your to-do list. He's not happy about your thoughts, though. He's disappointed that. If you were serious about your sin, you, you, you would fix that. After a while, you, you realize nobody in this room really knows you. They know your mask, but they don't know what you look like behind the mask. They don't know that you're struggling. They don't know that in spite of all your passionate sincerity, you don't believe that you really have pleased God for a minute of your life. You are exhausted bluffing and faking like you have it together. And so one night when nobody's looking, you slip out the back, bone tired and dejected and disillusioned. You walk out onto the path until you hit the fork in the road again. <sighs> Trusting God. <sighs> well, if there is no other option, and you find yourself out on the path that leads to the room of grace. <laughs> it's a lot less impressive room, but it is 
infinitely more inviting. Oh, you are welcomed into this loud conversation. And there are sincere smiles. Oh, my, there's not a mask to be seen anywhere. The people in this room, they are messy, but honest. They, they tell each other the truth about themselves and what they're struggling with, and nobody's trying to pretend like they've got it all together. Th there's, there's a silent message in this room, too. It says, God is delighted with you, wild about you, regardless of how you behave. The people in this room actually seem to believe that God loves them and likes them all the time, even when they mess up. After a while in this room, you find yourself slowly starting to tell the truth about yourself and the things you struggle with, and you are shocked to discover that God is right here in the midst of it, his arm tightly around you, loving you, enjoying you. He smiles at you and he says, <laughs> You know, I really am big enough to handle your stuff, all of it. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't shock me. It never comes between you and me. I am crazy in love with you on your very worst day. Now listen to me. I just want you to trust me with who I say you are. And I want you to learn to let other people love you with all your stuff. It will free you to love like crazy because you will have experienced being loved. Imagine a room like that. Welcome to the room of grace. We work really hard here at Cornerstone to create a safe place without judgment, without fear, to tell others who you really are. The burden unfortunately, is upon each of us as individuals to trust, right? That's that path. It's the trusting path. And <clears throat> we're ending in communion because really this is the greatest symbol of trust right here. Romans 5.8 says, this is how God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were cleaning up our act, while we got everything together, all our stuff together, no, it doesn't say that, right? God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still sinning, while we were cheating on God, Christ gave up his life for us. What does his shed blood accomplish for us? All of our past, present, and future sins are covered completely. Did you hear that? Past, present, and future sins are covered. That's what grace does.